just uh, start off my part of this talk today just by acknowledging the uh, Piscataui or Kanoi people, the first peoples of this land whom we're meeting on. And uh, when I look around the room and I don't see any of the First Nations peoples here, it just kind of reminds me that it's a very privileged spot that I'm standing in to be able to talk to you here. And it's really as much due to the systemic inequalities as any sort of personal achievement. And I just wanted to acknowledge all of that. So I'm going to start off talking about who I am, what we mean by engagement, some of our strategies that we've used in Defeat HIV, and some of our relationships. So I'll give you a sort of overview of the talk that I have here. My name is Michael, and I am the CAB coordinator for Defeat HIV, and there is my email address for all of you. Um, there's so many things that I have to share with you that I would, cannot get into 10 minutes, um, but if you have any questions about anything I've said or not said, please do contact me because I love communicating. So what is engagement? Well, if you were to ask any of the high school students that I used to teach, they would tell you what an engagement is. You know, there's a ring on it, right? It's a relationship. It's a creation of relationship. And it's even more than that. It's a maintenance of a relationship. Um, and who are we relating to? Well, sometimes individuals, sometimes groups. And those people could be local. They could be national or international. Um, and why are we doing it? Well, we're trying to align the interests. You have researcher interests, and you have community interests, and what you're hoping to get is some sort of cooperation between the two. And if we remember the early days, there seemed to be a lot of that not happening. Um, and so we have things like cabs now to help sort of speed that alignment along. How do we get there? Well, there are some principles that have been uh, outlined for us, and so a lot of this work has been done, and I just wanted to put some of them up here and give a shout-out, actually, to AVAC, who uh, has provided some of these things, and you can look on their website if you're interested in their good participatory practices, uh, from which all of those that you see on the slide here come from. But what makes it meaningful? Well, I'm not going to answer that for you, not yet at least. Um, so some of our strategies that we have here, we do have a cab, we put on a lot of events, we have these things that we call ambassador visits, or uh, I'm going to sort of change that into a community conversation. We do webinars, we've actually stepped into translating some of our materials, and we're also uh, very involved in social media, and I'm going to be sharing some of the uh, practices of that. So you all have heard the word cab, probably you all think you know what a cab is, uh, but there are probably people who might be watching this or listening to this who have no idea and are thinking of a taxi when I say cab. Um, a cab is a representative of groups from the general public or from a community um, who meet with representatives of an institution, and it's about relaying information, and you'll see the Venn diagram there sort of showing you all the things that are involved with being a cab just without using words. Um, and here is our Defeat HIV cab, at least some of the members. If you've ever had a big family portrait or tried to get one and try to get everyone in one picture, it's really kind of hard. So this is just some of our cab. Our cab is sort of run through consensus, and they had worked out a policies and procedures document, and their mission statement, which they chose, was to serve as a communications link and mobilize HIV cure researchers, their institutions, and our communities to work together to cure HIV. And how do they do that? Well, giving you an idea of our sort of approach to cab work. Social justice is a big issue. Um, issues of inclusion, access, and equity always are coming up. And how we talk about cure is also important, being intentional and attentive to the language that we've chosen, um, developing literacy and research, uh, developing skills, and developing some personal growth among our cab members is also important and also creating a very diverse cab that ensures that the input from people living with HIV is accounted for in all of the cab decisions, and hopefully that then spills into the collaboratory as a whole. Um, we meet monthly, and we uh, have a lot of things that we try to do to promote inclusion, which includes we have a dinner that we offer that's a home-cooked meal, um, and we also give bus tickets to help people get home, and we've moved from being on the campus at Fred Hutch to off-site, and actually I'm sort of proud to say that we have our meetings at the Cal Anderson House, which is the first housing that was created specifically for people who are living with HIV, and it felt very significant for us to move in there uh, to have our meetings. Um, we've done a lot of events as a cab, 
And some of our biggest events involve Timothy Ray Brown, the first person to be cured of HIV. In fact, our first event with him had over 380 people show up. Um, we did a lot of smaller events around there, bringing him into the community. And then we also did another event right before Croy two years ago where we brought Gera Hooter over and had Timothy and he appear at our public library, which had about 180 people show up. It's really a wonderful thing to be able to have Timothy and use him as a catalyst to start conversations around HIV cure research. And uh, one of the other offshoots of that was since Timothy was a sort of hometown boy, he was born and raised in Seattle, even though we know him as the Berlin patient, we got to sneak him into the Gay Pride Parade in 2013, which was uh, some feat if you know sort of any of the regulatory things around a Pride Festival. And I also got him onto the stage at the big uh, Seattle Center Pride celebration. So we really got to reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And one of my own personal memories of that was being able to tell people that uh, their lives had changed and they didn't even know it yet, and that someone had been cured and that cure started in 20 or 2007, and just the sea of faces that had their mouths wide open going, oh, back then in 2013 was sort of a precious memory, memory for me. We also had uh, one of the pictures from that parade appear in The Advocate. So again, expanding sort of the ways that you can engage people. But we also do events with other people involved too. And so we've uh, had cure experts uh, come and do community events with us. And you can see up there on the slide, there's Francois on the one side. We also had recently a really great event that featured uh, Gary Steinkall, or you may know him as Patient B of the two Boston patients that became sort of famous when their story hit in 2013. Um, all of these things are on our YouTube channel, so if you're curious to see how these events go, you can see the video recordings of them. The one thing about doing events that's really great is that you can try to get media, and I would inv uh, invite any of you who are trying to do events to really work on your press releases, because getting a good press release means you're going to get some good media coverage. So you can see some, from some of the examples we have there, we got the top of the fold of the Seattle Times. Um, I had just recently from our Cured Not Cured event, we had some uh, evening news coverage. We were on a talk show when Timothy was around. And one of the other things that was a sort of personal point of pride is we got into The Stranger, <laughs> which if you knew in Seattle, is a sort of a big deal because they have a wide readership. Um, we also, instead of just doing events, we tried to take Cure to people. We tried to go to their territory, so to speak, and speak about cure research. Um, so we call them ambassador visits, where we try to take it in that way. But I also wanted to try to change that and make it more of a community conversation. You can see in this picture here, we have the Deltas, uh, a service sorority uh, that focuses on the African-American populations. Um, we also went to Chief Seattle Club, um, who deal with uh, the urban native populations in Seattle to talk about cure. Here's a conversation that we had, which was all about what cure meant to you, and it was a beautiful conversation. And uh, Dr. Michael Letterman was our sort of featured guest in that conversation. And uh, we've also had Phil Wilson come in and talk about uh, cure and put that into the context of prevention and treatment as well. We do webinars, and we've had uh, much success with those as well. Uh, one of the things I would love to point out about a webinar is that you can always record them and make them into a video that people can access later, so it's not just something that's limited to the time in which you do the webinar. And so really look into that if you are looking for uh, ways to reach people beyond the, mo uh, the immediate moment. Um, we also have stepped into translation, and we were very fortunate to have a CAB member who speaks Spanish, so we were able to do a presentation in Spanish and then also record it, and so we uh, offer that on our YouTube channel as well. And Manuel is here in the audience, and hopefully you will get to meet him while you are here in the next three days. We also have a lot of social media as a presence, and we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and we are on YouTube. And if you want to do one thing today, I would say find us on one of those social media platforms, like us, and follow us. Mm. Sorry, I needed some water. <laughs> um, so, doing social media has been uh, sort of a concern of mine. But one of the things, before you go into social media, just don't think you're going to open up a Facebook page and it's all going to be magic, because it ain't. You need to work on your messages. What are your messages, and how are you going to get them out there? So I wanted to share with you some of the messaging that I chose, because I wanted to try to open up and make a cure talk 
open to people. So you'll see some of the examples. It's going to take everyone to find a cure for HIV. There will be no cure without you, and we all need an HIV cure. We're sort of the three prime messages that seem to get a lot of play in our social media. Um, so I'm just going to be showing you some of the examples of the imagery, because one of the things that's really important, I found out in social media, is that you need good imagery. I made all of these images, and um, sometimes you might not even have an image that you're going to be using. You might want to just use words and text and do it that creatively. But the difference between who is going to actually interact with you is vitally different. If you don't have an image, you won't get much play. One of the things I did try to do is put cure into context um, of what has already been going on in HIV. So I took the National HIV Awareness Days and tried to create a cure message around those so I could post it. So here is something for National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Here is National Women and Girls HIV Awareness Day. And then we have National Native HIV Awareness Day. And we have National Youth HIV Awareness Day. I even went into testing, the National HIV Testing Day. This image really flew without any sort of paid boosting that you can do on any social media. Just putting this one out there, it got a lot of play. It seemed to hit a nerve for people. And uh, it's still a sort of a wonderful thing for me to try to figure out what has made that happen. When you get engagement in social media, you're not going to know if it's going to be some sort of catfish or some sort of troll or if it's actually going to be a real engagement. So this man who looks like John Travolta contacted me, um, and it turned out it wasn't John Travolta, surprisingly, and he's become some of a regular feature in my Facebook messaging. He is a young individual and inf recently infected with HIV. He lives in Georgia, the country, not the state, and you can see some of his questions. He is really following along things, and any time any of the news hits, he's always asking me questions about what to believe. This is what engagement can look like on a Facebook page. You never know what you're going to get with that. Yes. And so the one thing I wanted to warn you about is that our Facebook page is always under attack by spellcasters in our comments section, uh, meaning that they're trying to peddle their own sort of false cures, and you're going to have to be aware of that when you are doing social media things. Also, you have relationships that you're trying to build. You have relationships within your collaboratory as well as outside of your collaboratory. And we've had a lot of success in our collaboratory. We have CAB all throughout, including now on our executive committee and in our organization committee for the conference we put on. Um, and we are also going to be working on some focus group activities uh, for this next iteration, specifically trying to get at not only uh, the uh, attitudes facing cure, but looking at how cell and gene therapies might add an additional barrier to those things. And that will be interesting to see how we uh, get there. Um, the relationships outside of Defeat HIV are really great, but the one that I wanted to strive for all of you to think about is look toward your public library system. They are a wonderful ally, and they will help you immeasurably, I think, gain credence in a community if you can use them. Um, I also wanted to say, you take what you find and bring it to conferences like this and other scientific meetings, uh, which is one of the things that our CAB likes to do and the MDC CAB likes to do. I wanted to hit up poster 73 and 74 for you all to check out today. Um, I wanted to thank the Defeat HIV CAB because they taught me that nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. And these are the names of the people who were involved with us. And I wanted to thank you all for your time. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Well, people are getting up. Maybe I can start with, with, with one. Hans Peter, you, you're, you're knocking off CCR5 or putting in some other resistance construct into progenitor cells. How many cells need you to protect in order to get a durable uh, effect and sustain diminution of HIV rebound? What do you think that number is going to be? We don't have that magic number no, from the, from the knockdown or knockout studies, but from the lentiviral and transduced no, studies that we've used no, using the C46, I suspect anywhere between probably more than 10%. You know, that's where we've seen an effect. So I think it's doable. So I do think it's doable, and we're working obviously also with the CCR5 knockout technology to get to that point. Dan? 
Uh, Dan Kritzkis again. Um, uh, Keith, uh, with respect to the ECD4IG work that you're doing, which is really very interesting, uh, I know there are plans to do human PK studies to d in uninfected volunteers, but it's unclear right now what the plans are to determine the actual antiviral activity of ECD4IG, which we learned in the VRC01 experience seems to be an FDA requirement for eventually doing studies uh, in infected uh, participants. And I know your immediate studies are focusing in primates. I'm just curious, where does the development of ECD4IG stand overall? Yeah, so our, so the studies that we're planning to do in the initial phases are all these initial primate studies, and I think they'll inform some of those decisions. Um, you know, quite honestly, we have hoped to follow on the shoulders of some of those other studies to, 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 uh, to pave the way for our uh, human uh, application later on in the collaboratory. Um, but it may turn out that we need to go after some of those questions directly, and if so, we'll, we'll modify our plans to do that. Sharon? Um, Michael, that was a totally amazing talk, and what um, the CAB have done for Defeat HIV is really super impressive. And I just wanted to, you to comment on ways that the CABs are going to work together so that we can, you know, you, all the sort of um, different tools you're generating, images, are things that we should all be using. And there was a talk about this at the beginning that they, the CABs would be very coordinated. I know there was a little bit of that in the last iteration of the Martin Delaney Collaboratories, but do you want to talk a bit about that? Because there's so much, you've done so, so many great things, it'd be great to share all that. I did, oh, push it, but don't hold it down, got it. Um, yeah, well, so tomorrow is gonna to be the start, I think, of that for us here in terms of the Martin Delaney Collaboratories, where we're going to have all of the community members and people who are in, around the community members and supporting them coming together so we can start to hash out how do we all cooperate. The last iteration, there were only three collaboratories. Now we've doubled that size, and we've spread it so to, uh, wide, so it's about really First of all, to coming together to figure out how we can use things together. And then, of course, there's not just the Martin Delaney Collaboratories. We have other research networks and trying to work together through the community partners that Hank sort of organizes and getting cabs to talk to other cabs, uh, I think will be vital. And then, of course, there's the uh, NGOs and the CBOs to invite into this conversation. So I think it's really about being open and being welcoming and having a platform for anyone to wash up upon your shore and feel like they've come home. Um, so I think that's really the guiding principle that I personally try to follow, is if anyone reaches out and gets in touch with me, I want them to feel like they've made it home in some way. Dezan? Thank you. That was actually a great question that leads into mine, and especially with your last comment there, Michael. I um, want to first commend the collaboratories for really ramping up the efforts around their community engagement strategies. And the, your presentation really was a robust expression of what Defeat HIV has done in that regard. But in each of the collaboratories, one of the things that I've noticed is that beyond the community advisory board, uh, structure itself is that there's very little intentional participation, outreach, inclusion, contracting even of local NGOs and community based organizations themselves that tend to be the front line and also the dependable partners in these studies. So I'd really like to hear some feedback on the organizing going forward of the collaboratories, including Defeat HIV, in how you're directly engaging and robustly compensating community-based organizations for the roles that they can play. Because I think that there's a dual opportunity in building capacity on both sides for not only research literacy, but for what I call community literacy for researchers. <laughs> and that that actually is a value that should be compensated, especially in time and an era where community-based organizations are really struggling to find their place and to be compensated for that place in the ongoing research. So I'd really like to hear how you're thinking about, beyond including in those activities, mm -hmm. the robust engagement of CBOs. Uh, thank you for that, because I feel like you just spoke what I feel personally going on here. And uh, it's really difficult when there is sort of a, a lack of support for those things to actually make it be equal partners and equal partnerships. Um, and so it's a sort of personal view of mine and it's also part of my work ethic to try to change that. And it's not just through the Defeat HIV cab, I'm also involved with the three other cabs that are in Seattle. And so 
One of my hopes is to build a mechanism by which we have community-based participatory research and there is a mechanism for people, if they have a research question that just pops up to them, that they know that they can come to this one area and bring that question and that there are community people as well as researchers skilled at taking something that might be a diamond in the rough and knowing how to sort of cultivate it and build that capacity, not only within the person who had the original question, but the CBO that may have brought them to us, and then in the researchers themselves who need to, I think, become more community friendly than they currently are. Um, so that's at least my personal uh, take on that, and I hope we can talk about more of that tomorrow at our two-hour lunch, because I think that's really where the future lies. Thank you. Ramesh. Uh, this is a question for Hans Peter. Um, in your data with the C46 treated animals, um, it's nice to see the viral loads have gone through a steady decrease. And also nice to see that the um, transduced cells have been actually selected and enriched. Uh, did you also try to see uh, if there is any decrease in the latency viral reservoir in these animals? Not in these animals. We have, we, those samples are actually still, Chris is still analyzing those. So don't, I don't have the answer on that yet. Paul. So uh, maybe to Larry, uh, the, the stuff is really exciting, obviously, and I think the potential for cell and gene therapy is uh, nicely spelled out. But one of the concerns has been the scalability of this. Can you comment on... Uh, what directions might be the most promising in terms of really scalable cell and gene therapy yeah. approach, and is that something you're pursuing uh, yeah, I, in parallel? I, I, yeah, I, I should have spent more time on this, but, but um, I think the f delivering a defined cell product is really something that needs to be done, and if it's done, um, one will have lower doses, a cheaper product, and a more consistent product. So. Um, we use a EGRFT marker on all the, uh, in, the, um, in the vector, so every cell that's infused, actually you know, is a, is a transformed um, uh, T cell, um, uh, or a, you know, a real car, effective CAR T cell. Um, one is seen um, with better ex vivo expansion techniques, um, a greater understanding of what the product is, as well as its then subsequent proliferative effects. Some early preparations, 50% of the cells were an XN5 positive or caspase 3 positive, so you're giving essentially programmed dead cells. So um, I think the, the point here is, is that the manufacturing and process development is rapidly occurring in CAR T cells. Uh, there's some really um, big differences between the, the, the preparations, the, the first preparation of throwing, you know, just using an antiviral vector, putting it all in, uh, and just infusing it. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, I think, of first generation cars, it's amazing is that, that, that it's worked. But I think for HIV, um, we're going to need more of a dental pick approach. We're going to really need to know um, to reduce the toxicity, to think about dosing, uh, in my opinion, under area under the curve until we produce uh, escape. And if we do produce escape, then, you know, we, we counteract that by having mixtures of CAR T cells. So I think the evolution of this field in, in essentially the ex vivo expansion aspect of this is really the critical part. And it is really the process development is absolutely going in incredibly. Um, and I think they're making a huge difference. And it will take a little while, but um, I think the progress that's occurring in the CD19 CAR T cells is really incredibly rapid. Um, I think we're going to see it by leaps and bounds, and I, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to understand neurotoxicity and to give low doses such that we can actually do it in HIV. Great. So we have two more panelists to hear from, so uh, let's give uh, Deb Fuller and, and Chris Peterson a chance to... Close us out. Yeah, um, I'm uh, from the University of Washington in the Washington National Primate Research Center, and uh, my role in this program is really twofold. The first, as alluded to by Hans Peter and Keith, is to uh, bring in uh, therapeutic vaccination as an approach in combination with gene editing. Uh, my group uh, a few years ago demonstrated that therapeutic DNA vaccine could induce significant viral remission at about 50% of SIV-infected monkeys. Building on this approach, we've then uh, uh, started a collaboration with Jim Mullins, who with uh, um, Barb 
Felber and George Pavlakis uh, have developed a conserved elements DNA vaccine approach, which addresses the enormous issue of CTL escape. And so we're uh, um, excited about the prospect of actually using uh, uh, therapeutic DNA vaccination with the conserved elements vaccine coupled to gene editing to protect those cells from infection and perhaps even direct them to sanctuary sites as, as an approach that could be very effective. Um, I also wear a second hat, which is really uh, the immune profiling of all of these approaches in the non-human primate. Uh, as a result of some of my previous research, we ended up uh, finding that uh, what happens in the mucosal and lymphoid tissues can be very different from what you see in the peripheral blood. And so we have developed a, a whole range of assays and methodologies in the non-human primate to really study and interrogate what, uh, how the effects of different treatments on these different compartments and, and immune responses. And I am working within uh, Hans Peter's lab and also coordinating across the, the three R IRFs that Hans Peter and Keith talked about as well as the animal core. I'm, I'm co-PI of the animal core with Deb um, and also I'm coordinating with, with the immunology studies and also the tissue collections for all of the, the NHP work that's being done. Um, the, the biggest goal here is to coordinate these projects. I think we think that the combinatorial aspect is going to be very important. So being able to keep the three IRFs sort of along the same track so that we can compare the individual data and start to bring them together in later years is, is a big focus of mine. Um, I think another thing that we bring to the table is, is there's been a lot of things that have been brought up today about conditioning regimens and uh, also spacing between infection and art. And these are all things that we have a lot of experience in from our Defeat HIV 1.0 that, that we can uh, apply here as well. Uh, and then just to bring things back to Michael one more time, I think another thing that, that I am interested in is core or, or communicating the NHP work that we do to the community. This is a sensitive area, but it's also a very important area. And it's been a very valuable collaboration to work with Michael in that regard. Thank you to the panel, and I please join me in thanking the three collaboratories, um, Believe, Dare, and Defeat HIV, for a really ex a wonderful morning. Uh, it's now lunch, and we will reconvene at 2.15, and Carl has a few announcements.